please join me in welcoming Scott to Google. Thanks. Well, I'm very excited uh, today to talk to you about uh, some of the highlights from Stretch. And I thought I would ask uh, a question to get things started. I mean, think about something important that you want to get done. It could be at work. It could be outside of work. And suppose that I offered you more time, more money, and more expertise to get that done. What would you say? I mean, you'd probably say yes. Um, but it turns out that sometimes the best answer to that question is actually no thank you. We're conditioned to believe that if we want to get stuff done, the more resources we have, the more effective that we're going to be. We believe that a marker of our success and a cause of our success is getting as many resources as possible. This is what I call chasing. The idea that the more that we have, you want to make a, a product that's not working better, add more marketing dollars. You want schools to be more effective, hire more teachers. Government to work better, increase the budget. You want to improve a relationship, buy an expensive gift. It turns out, though, that there's uh, quite a bit of research that shows that this approach that I call chasing doesn't always produce the best results. And in fact, in many cases, it also harms our well-being. And I know it's Valentine's Day, so I thought it would be very appropriate to talk about chocolate today. One of the reasons and one of the dangers that we see uh, with chasing is this concept that psychologists call mindless accumulation. We focus on trying to get as many resources as possible, and we lose sight of what our actual goals are. So let me tell you a study that was done by a University of Chicago professor, Christopher Shee. What he did is he had participants come into a laboratory, and he said, OK, we're going to give you two, two things here. We're going to give you a chance to earn chocolate. Who doesn't want to earn chocolate? And then we're going to give you a chance to eat chocolate. Who doesn't want to eat chocolate? Uh, but there's a catch. You're going to actually have to work for your chocolate. So you're going to be listening to some nice leisurely music, and then you're going to have to press a button. And when you press that button, it's going to interrupt that nice leisurely sound of music with the sound of saw cutting wood. Just like in the real world, there's different levels that you can earn. There's low earners. They unfortunately have to press the button many, many times, do lots of work to get a chocolate bar. Then there's the high earners. They're fortunate. Their rate of, uh, of earning chocolate is, is much better. They have to work a lot less. Importantly, the researcher said, whatever you earn, you're going to have to eat at the next phase. So you can't take any of this chocolate home. So it turns out that both the low earners and the high earners significantly over-earn the amount of chocolate that, that they either cared to eat or physically could eat. It actually turns out there's an upper limit. I know, again, on Valentine's Day, it's hard to imagine this. But there's only so much chocolate people can eat. What they had done is they just started mindlessly accumulating chocolate without actually thinking about, well, what are their goals? So the next part of the research was, well, is there a way that we can prevent this from happening? And what might this do in terms of uh, people's well-being? So the researchers put an earnings cap. And they said, OK, some of you are only going to be allowed to earn uh, so many chocolate bars. The other of you, you can earn as, as much as you, as you want to earn. Now, not surprisingly, those in the cap condition earned fewer chocolates than those in the uncapped condition. What is surprising is when you look at the well-being rates of the people in the cap conditions, even though they earn less and they ended up uh, consuming uh, you know, at levels that were closer to their, uh, to their actual goals, they were both happier earning the chocolate and they were also happy, happier eating the chocolate. And the reason for that is quite simple. They had calibrated between what their actual goals are, how much chocolate they could earn, uh, and how much they actually worked. They didn't overwork. They didn't mindlessly accumulate chocolate. And we can think about chocolate as a metaphor for what we do with a lot of our resources in life, whether we're trying to grow a business or we're trying to succeed in our careers or we're thinking about our personal goals. We tend to lose sight on what those actual goals are, and we focus on just trying to get as much stuff as possible, whether that be moving up to a bigger office, counting the ceiling tiles, uh, whether it means getting extra headcount or a bigger budget or a bigger house, we tend to focus on just trying to accumulate as many resources as possible without stepping back and reflecting what are the goals that I'm actually trying to emphasize. And so you see organizations do this all of the time. 
Does anyone know who said uh, this uh, infamous line, revenue solves all known problems? Anyone? I'll give you, I'll give you, who? I'll, I'll give you a hint. She used to work here. Nope. Marissa Meyer, right. That's right. So she's known around Google for, for saying this, and she carried this uh, philosophy uh, off to Yahoo. And the idea is, well, I mean, in the short term, this seems to make perfect sense. We bring in as many resources as possible, you know, the revenue, maybe it's employees, or whatever that resource is. And then the belief is that we can just do whatever we want, and we can solve all of those problems. Now, there's a couple of challenges with this, of course. Uh, one is that resources are not limitless, and eventually when resources stop flowing, you're left with a business model that's not sustainable, or you're left with a life that's not sustainable, or you're left with a career that's not sustainable. Uh, things tend to go in cycles, and by focusing on trying to acquire stuff and not making the most out of what you already have, you miss opportunities uh, to build more sustainable, uh, productive, and long-term businesses, careers, and lives. There's also the sense that we want to shy away from too few resources. We think that scarcity is really bad. And if we're in a, a resource-constrained organization, that's a bad thing. We think that when we have an abundance around us, we can, be, uh, we can do more things. Uh, but it actually turns out the research uh, shows a much different picture. And in one study, simply reflecting about whether or not you had abundance or whether or not you had scarcity impacted how creative and innovative you were. So imagine simply just thinking about a time when you were a child and you had a lot of things uh, versus when you were a child and you didn't have a lot of things. That actually tended to make you less creative in a completely separate activity, in this case, trying to find a use uh, for bubble wrap. And there's uh, some uh, good reasons for this. When you have abundance around you, uh, you tend to default to the conventional ways of using resources. So you want to get a picture into the wall, and you've got a very big toolbox. You're going to think immediately of the hammer, and you're going to search around your entire house. Maybe you've got a, a garage you haven't cleaned in a while, and you're going to keep looking for that hammer. When you're under scarcity, your first instinct isn't to find the perfect tool. Your first instinct is to actually look at the tools that you already have and find different uses for them. So you might take the bottom of your shoe and just get that nail right into the wall and not take the time to go ahead and find the hammer. So there's something to be said about having a, a mindset uh, that embraces scarcity. And there are some dangers that when you're around abundance, namely you, you tend to do things conventionally. You tend to take less risks. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the history of, for example, startup organizations and how they grow over time, what makes them often successful is their unbelievable ability to be resourceful. Then they grow up, and they want the markers of success. They want a nicer building. They want more staff. They want bigger budgets. Everyone wants a, a better office, because it's all about uh, a quest for status. And they end up abandoning many of the principles that made them successful in the first place. Because we tend to think of being resourceful as something that we use only under necessity. We can imagine the startup in the garage. But we have a hard time thinking about larger organizations, resource-rich organizations, embracing resourcefulness. Because resourcefulness doesn't seem to be high status. It seems to be something reserved for those of lesser means. So in many respects, it takes a lot of courage to be resourceful, to recognize that actually the amount that you have isn't as significant in many cases as what you actually do with what you have. And this is what I call stretching. It's the belief that the better use of your resources, the better results you're going to get. You don't focus your entire careers, your organizations, and your lives on trying to acquire more stuff whether it be physical stuff or immaterial stuff. It's all about, how do I get creative and engage with the resources that I already have? And once you get into that mindset, you open up a whole new set of possibilities for thinking about everything from how you would grow a business, to how you would work, to how you would live your lives. So uh, some really important distinctions between stretching and chasing. When you're stretching, you have a belief that a resource is changeable. It's not fixed to a single use. But when you're chasing, you think that resources have a singular use. You can only use a chair, for example, in one particular way. You can't get creative with your resources. 
When you're stretching, your main action is about expanding. How do you take the resources around you and find new ways, new, new domains of using your skills, for example? Whereas with chasing, your whole uh, way of being is around trying to acquire more resources. And the reason for that is the differences in motivation. When you're stretching, you're focusing on what your actual goals are. You're not just trying to mindlessly accumulate the proverbial chocolate. You're trying to think, what, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Do you really need this amount of capital? Or do you really need this amount of people? Or do you really need this type of title to actually do something? In many cases, you don't. But when you're chasing, you're on this endless quest for social comparisons. You're looking at what your neighbor has, uh, what a competing organization has, and you're thinking that you need these same things to succeed. You delay doing things until you have those same type of resources. If I only had a better job title, I can have the impact that I want at work. If my team only had one more person, I can get this much more work done. The problem with social comparisons, of course, is that they're endless. It's like you're on a treadmill. You can, you can raise the speed of the treadmill, but you get no farther on that treadmill because there's always going to be something, someone, some organization that has more than what you have. So it becomes a winless game. So the question then becomes, once you can embrace this mindset of stretching and realize that it's not about acquiring resources and the quantity of resources that matters, it's really about what you do with your resources, how do you build the skills in order to stretch? And I'm going to share with you today four different ways based on research to do this. I'll talk about diversifying experience. We'll next talk about the importance of acting now and improvisation. Then we'll move to setting high expectations. And then finally, making unthinkable combinations. Now, experts have a really important uh, role to play in society and inside their organizations. I mean, right, you wouldn't want to go to your accountant to get a tooth pulled, just like you wouldn't want your dentist to do your taxes. So experts have a really important role. There's no question about it. But one of the things that really surprised me as I was doing research for the book is that the um, amount that expertise impacts performance is actually surprisingly not as high as we might think. Now, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers popularized uh, what's become known as the 10,000 hour rule. The notion that if you develop uh, enough practice at something, you become so proficient at it that you can have high uh, performance. And Anders Ericsson has a, has a good book called Peak uh, based off of his research uh, that Gladwell also used uh, about this topic. But if you actually go into the, uh, into the, the data, uh, what I'm sharing with you right now is what's called a meta-analysis. It's a study of studies. It looks across you know, most of the published work that examines the relationship between practice and performance. And in something like chess, about 26% of performance comes from practice. That's pretty good, but probably not as high as you would have guessed. When you get to music, the relationship is 21%. Sports, 18%. This next one really gives me a bit of pause, because as a professor, I don't like see it saying that 4% uh, in education uh, comes from practice. And for the professionals, which is what most of us do, that relationship is almost non-existent. Now, these numbers are really striking, uh, but there's also a really fascinating pattern here. If you compare you know, what's going on with games like chess to what's happening with professions, there's one clear difference between these. It's that as activities become less structured, the role of expertise in predicting performance becomes less and less significant. So as we go to more uh, everyday situations that most people who work face, and society becomes less predictable, or work becomes less predictable, practice doesn't always make perfect. Because we can practice what we don't know. And when the rules are static and they're fixed, like they might be in chess, there's some impact of performance. But as the rules become more fluid and changing, practice tends to matter a lot less. And I'd argue that this effect is only going to be amplified in the next few years as we find ourselves in an environment where things are very hard to predict. Like, who knows what happened on Twitter in the first 10 minutes of this talk. Another important aspect of stretching is the idea of acting. Now, we tend to like to think that we want to plan our best performances. And we spend a lot of time trying to develop strategic plans, plan out our careers. It turns out the relationship between thinking about five-year strategic plans and organizational performance is almost non-existent. It's very modest. But we tend to invest a lot of resources in this because we think that's what leads to the best results. So let me uh, give you. Uh, a different way about thinking about it. And it starts with this gentleman over here, who I'm guessing no one in the room knows who this is. 
Okay. You might recognize his name, and for sure, you recognize his work. Uh, this is Dan Wyden. He's an advertising executive. Uh, many years ago, Dan Wyden was struggling with a problem. He was in his makeshift office. It was at the basement of a building. He couldn't even afford a regular working telephone. His office phone was a payphone, which they had back then. And he was trying to come up with a way of unifying a bunch of advertising campaigns for an upstart client of his. And he kept struggling and he struggling. He couldn't figure out how to do this. And finally, it was the pressure of time constraints that helped him make the most unusual of connections. He thought about something that happened about 10 years before, when he was reading the newspaper about a man by the name of Gary Gilmore. Gary Gilmore, to say the least, was not a very nice person. He was a lifelong criminal. He'd done some pretty horrible things, and he had committed what turned out to be his last crime. He had brutally murdered two people. Dan Wyden was reflecting on this uh, set of events and was remembering that, unlike most people on death row, Gary Gilmore wanted to die. So his mother tried to step in and write a letter of leniency, and Gary Gilmore said, you know, go away. Lots of organizations you know, were advocating for him to get life in prison and not be sentenced to death, and he told them to go away. So Gary Gilmore finally got his wish, and his last words before he was executed were, let's do it. That was enough for Dan Wyden to finish his work, because he made the most unusual of connections. Because the advertising slogan that he came up with went on to be arguably the most effective one ever in the history of advertising. And this is a really telling story for a few different reasons. One is, you think about taking something that seems to have very little value. Right? You wouldn't think that most brands would want to uh, take inspiration from a uh, lifelong criminal, but I mean, that's where, this, that's where this slogan comes from. It's about how you can be resourceful and turn something that looks like it's not valuable at all into something that could be tremendously valuable. Secondly, you think about the environment in which Dan Wyden was able to come up with this. He was embracing those resource constraints, and it was that time pressure. It was working in that environment that helped him come up with this idea. And third, the idea itself is such an important part of stretching, because it's this idea that we just need to act with whatever we have. We can't wait for tomorrow. We can't wait for the bigger office or the bigger budget or the better title or whatever it is that we're waiting for. We have to start doing things with what we already have. And when we do things with what we already have, we start learning. We start experimenting. We learn about the situations that we're facing. We learn about each other. We learn about ourselves. And that allows us to get a lot of stuff done. It also means we have to lose the comfort of having everything pre-planned out, getting more comfortable with improvisation. Because oftentimes, what happens when we plan is we end up planning for a future that no longer exists. One of the reasons why five-year plans never work is we just don't know what's going to happen in five years. Things are so uncertain, we bake these assumptions into our plans that we then believe are true, and we act as if they are true. But when they turn out not to be true, our plans end up being uh, worthless. So what we do is we think about how we can become more improvisationally acting with what we already have and not wait. Now, of course, there's some dangers in this, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up. One of the things that you want to make sure you're doing when you're improvisationally acting is making sure that there's a constant stream of experiments to learn. So in this example, this person, I would say, is leaping without looking. He's simply just jumping off of a, off a building. Uh, that doesn't tend to be uh, a very good thing. You want to make sure that you're balancing this notion of acting without planning with the ability to learn and make adjustments. So you don't want to just simply fly by the seat of your pants. That's not what I'm recommending. What I'm recommending is a constant approach where you are experimenting, learning, and re-experimenting with what you have, not waiting for what you don't have. So one of the things I like to do with my students is I put them in these situations where I have them improvise in the middle of class. So instead of uh, you know, running a regular class, we all get up there, and they play what's called the yes-and game. They get in a circle, and they have to talk about the ideas 
of the session through that lens of yes and, where they don't know what, what the person next to them is going to say or the person across the circle is going to say. And they start learning to get more comfortable with being in an environment where they embrace uncertainty. And they use that uncertainty as a way to come up with new ideas. One of the implications of this is it also changes the way that we might want to think about running a meeting. So I learned this firsthand. When I uh, taught my first class at the University of Michigan, you know, I have participation as one of the metrics that, that I grade on. And lo and behold, when you put participation in the syllabus, everyone wants to participate all of a sudden. So you end up with a stream of hands up in the room. Everyone wants to talk and get airtime. And at first, I'm like, this is wonderful. You know, people really love this class. They keep wanting to, uh, to raise their hands. But it then became disruptive after a while because you have all these hands up and it you know, becomes you know, hard, to, hard to stay focused and everyone's kind of jockeying and then it's, it becomes an exercise of who can raise their hands the highest and stuff like that. So I thought I came up with a very ingenious solution. I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say I'm going to call on you and you and you and you and I maybe pick five or six different people and then that would be a way of controlling the crowd. It turned out this was an absolutely awful idea. Because what happened is, I noticed that by the time I might get to the third or fourth student, he or she would, you know, in this really you know, eloquent way, have these amazing comments uh, that they would speak. And they would be saying this in such a way, like, I was just telling you something that you know, was the best thing since sliced bread. It was just this amazing comment. And they had that look of confidence on their face. The problem is everyone else in the room had like a look of horror on their face. And the student couldn't figure out, why is everyone looking at me so funny? I just made this brilliant comment. And objectively, it, was, it really was a brilliant comment. Well, what had happened is that student had literally just repeated what the person next to them had said. I mean, it was almost the exact verbatim comment. Because what happens is, and what psychology shows is, that as much as nine seconds before it's our turn to speak, and as much as nine seconds after we actually do end up speaking, our mind shuts down from listening. We have a hard time multitasking between speaking and listening when we know that our turn is coming. It's what's called the next in line effect. And when we set a speaking order, whether we go around the room at a meeting or we speak in terms of our, our level or custom, we're basically having people, we're encouraging them to prepare their speeches and they spend that time preparing it and they prepare that performance, but they fundamentally shut off from listening. And when they listen, not only are they losing the contributions of what other people said, but they also, uh, you know, by the time they end up speaking, their comments could be just as irrelevant as my students' comments. So it's very dangerous, I guess, to, to set a speaking order is the, the um, uh, lesson I want to get across. And so what I, I tend to recommend is think more about your meetings as this exercise, uh, like an improvisational exercise. You, want to, you don't want complete chaos. And even if you look at the best jazz bands, I mean, there's structure even in jazz music and in jazz improvisation. But there's also a lot of flexibility. And you don't know when it's your turn, so you can prepare. And when you can prepare to speak, you're focusing on listening, because you need to know when the exact time to jump in is. Okay. Number three, expectations. Expectations play a huge role in shaping resources. Specifically people, but in this case, uh, we're going to talk about a horse. Uh, this is a horse uh, from the turn of the, around the, the 18, uh, 1890s or so. His name was Hans, actually clever Hans, because he was, he was quite a horse. He actually could do math problems. You ask Hans what 7 plus 4 is, and he would tap his hoof 11 times. You'd ask him what you know, 10 divided by 3 is, he'd, hap he'd, he'd uh, tap his hoof 3 times plus 1 time for the remainder. It turns out that Hans could also spell and read. Now, no, you know, people were absolutely amazed by him, but no one actually believed that a horse could be this smart. So an entire commission of experts was put together. You had the zoologists. You had the circus experts. Everyone got together to try and figure out you know, what's going on with this horse. And they spent a couple of years trying to investigate this. And they concluded that nothing was going on with this horse. This horse indeed was clever Hans. While still baffled by this, a few years later, it would take someone who had both a biology and a psychology degree to really unravel the mystery of how this horse could do math and so many other remarkable things. Because it turned out that Hans was very clever, but he was clever not because he had these great cognitive skills in doing math. He was really clever because he was able to read body language and expectations. Even body language and expectations that his master, whoever was asking the questions, was not aware of. 
So Hans would look at people's uh, eyes, their facial expressions, what they did with their noses, and he would understand when he should stop tapping his hoof. And it didn't matter who was asking the question. If it was his master who had been training him for a while, or if it was some random stranger, Hans was able to pick up on these cues. And it turns out that people are just the same way when it comes time to picking up on cues. And the expectations that we set for them ends up playing a dramatic role in terms of what they end up producing. So this might be uh, uh, too much in the past for, for those of you to recognize, but uh, does anyone know what this, what this hat is, what we call this? Right, it's a, it's a dunce cap, and uh, it actually started off as a, um, as a positive thing. Uh, uh, there was John Scotus Dunce was a philosopher, a very well-respected philosopher from the 13th century. Um, he was very uh, detailed in his thinking and his analysis, and he had a whole bunch of followers called the Dunces. And that was, a, that was a high status thing until about 300 years after his death. And people got so sick and tired of all of the nitpicking of the dunces that they repurposed the word and they turned dunce uh, into a synonym for an idiot. Uh, the reason why the hat is pointy, by the way, is uh, for as much of a genius as John Scotus Dunce was, he believed that knowledge uh, came through, uh, through, uh, th uh, through your head. Through, so he wanted to create this wizard-like hat to funnel knowledge down into the head. So that was the origin of the dunce cap. And the dunce cap is probably one of the worst inventions uh, in education ever. And unfortunately, it still gets used in some forms in some countries. But the dunce cap was meant to shame children because the idea was that when children are acting up in school, they're acting up because of something in their control. And if you shame them, you're gonna get them to change their behavior. So you would, you would put the poor student in the back of the room, they would usually be sitting on the chair, and you put the cap on there, and they would think about their bad behavior, and it was just a matter of shaming them enough, and then they would be fixed, and they would come up and participate. And of course, the opposite happens, because when you put the dunce cap on someone, you're essentially setting low expectations for them, and you're messaging to them both explicitly and implicitly that I don't believe that you can accomplish a lot. I don't believe that you're gonna be bright. I don't believe that you're well-behaved. I don't believe you're a good employee. And that's exactly what they end up doing. So a lot of research on what's called the self-fulfilling prophecy in both psychology and sociology that looks at these effects. Everything from, you know, if we label children as gifted, they tend to be elevated to that gifted level, even if they are no different in cognitive ability than uh, any other child. Same thing at work in terms of how managers and supervisors interact with their employees. Now, oftentimes, our expectations are not as explicit as the dunce cap. And this is the real danger. We don't realize that we're putting the dunce cap on people. So we might give someone a more interesting assignment. And other employees might look and say, OK, it's obvious who has the dunce cap here, because look who's getting the more interesting work. Or an organizational change. I spend a lot of my research studying organizational change. We put the dunce cap on people all of the time. We tend to think that employees will resist change. So maybe we keep them in the dark. We don't tell them things because we're worried about what their negative reaction is going to be. Then when we unveil the change, we're almost baffled and surprised that employees resist change because they never participated and they were left in the dark. And that's the danger of the self-fulfilling prophecy is we end up having people live up to these expectations. But we can also do the very opposite. We can actually set what I call positive prophecies we can set positive expectations for people, and they end up living up to those uh, expectations. Now, what's important is uh, there's a big distinction between setting high expectations and setting expectations that create performance pressure. And you can look at people, uh, I mean, there's popular expressions like, you know, they choke. Uh, you can look at this in the context of sports. Uh, it turns out that having the home field advantage doesn't always work because of uh, what expectations uh, do to people. And so the key here is that you want to set expectations that are credible, that are believable. If the person that you're setting expectations for doesn't actually believe those expectations, this completely backfires. And it doesn't work. And in fact, it turns out worse. So you want to set high expectations, but you also want to set credible expectations so that the people who are being set those expectations fully understand and fully embrace and fully believe those expectations. The final part of the framework I'm going to talk to you about today is the power of unthinkable combinations. 
And I spent several years studying gourmet food trucks, which for someone who likes to eat, I mean, you can't think of a, of a better assignment. I actually gained 15 pounds doing this research that I had to work pretty hard to lose. Because it turns out that actually talking to people who work at a gourmet food truck is harder for me to get in touch with than talking to a Fortune 500 executive. Because these, these people, they, they don't have uh, email. They don't answer email. They don't answer their phones. They work 18-hour shifts. Um, so very hard to get a hold of. So the way you get a hold of them is you actually go eat their food and chat them up, which is a very fun and enjoyable way of doing research, but it's definitely a hazard to your health. Anyway, gourmet food trucks, some of the most resourceful businesses you can think of. So first of all, they are resource constrained. They don't have a lot of capital. You know, the amount of money it takes to open up a gourmet uh, food truck is five to 10 times less than what it would take to open up a brick and mortar restaurant. Many of them don't have, cust you know, they don't have followings. They're, they're brand new to this. You'd be surprised that a lot of them actually don't have any cooking experience. Um, they operate in a small metal box that might be the size of some of your closets. And in Houston, where I did this study, it can get up to 130 degrees inside there during the summer, and you're standing on your feet in 18-hour shifts. Of course, you, have less, less, uh, you don't have the latest and the greatest equipment. You don't have the best tools, because what can you fit on a truck? Uh, but you have to make do. And what I wanted to study is, well, how can this industry that seems to have so little end up producing so much? I mean, they, they produce really innovative food. They have some large followings. Many of them have used this as a springboard for success and have went to open up uh, some uh, well-received restaurants. They seem to be enjoying their work a lot. So what is it about this industry that allows them to get by? And not just get by, but in many cases thrive. So I started you know, interviewing all of these people. And what became uh, really apparent to me pretty quick in the, in the research is that these do something rather remarkable. They take what's not a resource at all to most people, their competition, and they turn it into their biggest resource. Because what they've done is they have created a way of interacting with each other that has turned these competitors into great friends. And some of the things that they do are extremely counterintuitive. So you know, it could be very simple things from, you know, you're a, pizza, a gourmet pizza truck and you run out of mozzarella cheese in the middle of your shift. You send out a tweet and another truck will deliver you cheese. You are selling cupcakes, and you don't have any wrappers left, and there's another dessert truck right next to you. You go over to them, and they lend you some, some cupcake wrappers so you can stay in business competing with them. You have a bad week. You didn't have a good shift. Uh, maybe there was something wrong with the weather. Uh, you didn't make a lot of money. Food trucks will start funneling business your way so the next week turns out better, so you stay in the black. So these remarkable instances of helping really struck me. And it really shows that even when you don't have a lot, if you look around you and you focus on what you do have, you can make an unthinkable combination. Well, sure, we have to compete. We are competing for the same resources. We're competing for the same customers. We're um, competing for the same parking spots, going to the same events. But we can also cooperate and help each other out. We can find these dynamics that allow us collectively to thrive, even if individually we're competing with each other. And that's something that stretchers do all the time, not just with uh, relationships and matching competition and friendship, but with other things. How do we take routines and make them flexible and full of creativity? How do we reconcile uh, goals for sustainability and development in the third world? We tend to think of economic development and environmental sustainability as completely separate. But what stretchers do is they find ways of working with the materials that they have to find this harmony between things that don't seem to fit together at all. And the gourmet food trucks, I think, were a perfect example of that. So I want to leave you with uh, a few thoughts, and then we have some time for, for questions. What I want you to think about is, as you, as you go back to, to work later today, what are you ultimately trying to accomplish? And how do you think about whether or not you're successful doing it? Do you tend to make comparisons to who's got a bigger team, who's got a better office, who's got a bigger title? who's got a bigger house, whatever those comparisons are, is this what's driving the way that you're thinking about things? To me, it's rather bizarre to think that that's the reason why we're here and that's the reason uh, why we're working is to get these things. Usually, those are, you think about those things as a means to an end. And once you divorce the idea 
that the ends are not getting more resources, it's actually doing more, it opens up a whole new exciting set of possibilities because there could be lots of different pathways to get to those goals that you really care about. It doesn't necessarily need to involve finding more resources. It's about working with the resources you already have in more creative, more uh, uh, engaging, and more resourceful ways. And I think what the research shows is that's going to make you not only more successful, but it's also going to make you a lot happier. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. And uh, uh, I think that's a very good uh, point about using limited resource to boost your business. And uh, but I was wondering, uh, do you have any uh, data, stat statistical data to support your point? Yes. Um, if you look at, uh, at the organizational level, for example, uh, the relationship between the amount of resources that you have and innovation uh, tends to be curvilinear. So it tends to be an inverted U-shape relationship. So having too many resources, just as harmful as having too few resources. So there's an inflection uh, a point uh, you know, around, the, um, around the midpoint where you know, having the optimal amount of resources. And it makes perfect sense for this. You have too few resources, you can't experiment, you, you can't do things, uh, you have very little slack. But you have too many resources, what happens is you lack urgency because you know, why worry about doing things right or doing things uh, well this first time because we have a lot to, to fall back on. Um, you also become complacent because you know, there's so much around. You know, why, do we, why do we need to really uh, make this project a priority? So it kind of saps away some of that motivation. So the, the, the data shows that the relationship is curvilinear. So I'm not saying you know, you know, completely eliminate your budget, uh, but the other side is there could be a curse, and there is a curse if you're kind of getting too much. So there's that happy medium that you need to find. Are there situations where the chasing mindset is preferable, or is it always better to stretch? I don't know if I want to say it's preferable, but I will say that you're, you're, you're very rarely going to find someone who's purely a stretcher and purely a chaser. I think we oscillate back and forth. The reason why I think that chasing is usually dangerous is because it displaces the goals that you tend to care about. Now, if your goal happens to be accumulation of resources, you know, maybe, maybe chasing uh, could be a way to go. But I would, I would say that very few people, that actually is their real goal. They might think that's their real goal, and they might look around and see other people having that goal and think that should be their goal. But I think if people really reflect on it, I don't really think that's their goal. So I think in that, maybe that one limited case, uh, chasing might, might serve you better but I think it would be a bit misguided. So you had a chart earlier that was talking about kind of the ratio of practice versus, I don't know, was it success, like with the chess and things like that? I was trying to understand how you were measuring on the professional sense. I mean, there are skills that we learn and there's always the practice, you know, whether it be communication, tough conversations, things like that. How do you actually weigh what goes into practice in like a professional setting? Yeah, so there's two things. So, so one is the independent variable and the other is the dependent variable. Uh, on the independent variable, this is a study of, of multiple studies. So each study had different ways of operationalizing um, you know, the amount of um, um, practice and the amount of performance. Sometimes it's time. Other cases, it's what's called deliberate practice, which is time that also has some learning involved. And on the performance side, this could be stuff like how your supervisor rates your job to more objective things, like if you're a salesperson, how much money you actually uh, were able to sell. So in this type of analysis, it you know, goes across all of those studies and combines them to look at what the effects are, taking into account all of the data points across all of these different studies. So there's a lot of different data that goes into this chart, which is what makes this chart that much more powerful. This is not from a single study. This is from a meta-analysis. And I mean, I was just as surprised to look at this study as I think you might be. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for coming. I actually really enjoy this uh, meta-analysis that you brought up here, and I was kind of curious, from your framework, you talk about things like diversity, um, ability to kind of translate ideas in different areas. I'm curious, what markers did you see in, from your framework that also were applied or used in these different studies as well? Yeah, so the, the thing with, with diversity is, 
So Gladwell has this thing, the, the 10,000 hour rule. What I advocate for in the book is what I call the multi-C rule. And multi-C stands for multi-context rule. Because if we start to look and unpack the data and we see the limitations of expertise, the question is, well, what might drive some, some better performance? And you know, there's not that much research on this because a lot of the research is focused on the relationship between you know, depth of knowledge in one area, like deliberate practice, like you see on this chart, and, uh, and performance. But the multi-C rule basically says, if you look at uh, the breadth of experience. So, you know, do people rotate jobs? Do they rotate different industries? Or do they develop experience through, you know, simply as finding someone who has your job in a different industry and spending some time with them, going to have lunch with them, how that impacts uh, performance? We tend to uh, prioritize specialized expertise. And it starts as early as you know, grade school, where we want our children to specialize. We have specific plans for how they're going to grow up. And then we want them to you know, go be engineers or, or do something on the professional side and not get, for example, like a liberal arts education or, or, or a broad background. But it turns out that that actually uh, isn't always the, the, the best bet on a number of different reasons. Uh, one other study I didn't talk about that I'll raise right now to your question is really fascinating study looking at some of the um, you know, most trickiest scientific uh, problems to solve. And what this uh, platform does is called Innocentive. It's kind of like a crowdsourcing platform for solving you know, really complex grand challenges. Is, uh, this study looked at uh, the relationship between the amount of expertise someone had in a scientific area and their likelihood to actually have the winning solution to that problem. And it turned out there actually was uh, quite a relationship between the amount of expertise and the, uh, of the person and the domain that it was in. In fact, it was negative, though. So in other words, the biologists were much more likely to solve the chemistry problem problems than the chemists themselves, and vice versa. The chemistry uh, people were able to solve the biologist problems more than the biologists themselves. And I think what it really speaks to is this idea that experts develop tunnel vision. They see the world through their own set of tools. They become used to those tools. They use those tools in a specific way. And that works in many routine situations. And that's why experts are really good. But a lot of what we're increasingly facing are non-routine situations. And when you're using your tools in the same way, you're missing opportunities to see the world differently. So you bring some outsiders in there, and they can look at those problems with a new set of eyes. And they can take their frameworks and their tools they've looked at in different domains and apply them uh, to your domain. Uh, but we tend not to do that. In fact, when we, when we form teams, we tend to want to focus on, well, you know, who, are, who are the experts? Who's got the most experience? Let's put them on those teams. Well, some completely different research, this one from a mathematical uh, perspective that uh, um, the mathematician uh, Scott Page from University of Michigan has done, has looked at uh, these simulations. And it shows that in, in many cases, picking names out of a hat is better than how most people form teams. And it goes back to the same idea of that diversity of experiences and what the entrenchment that happens when you have people who just know things well, but they only know that one thing well. All right, thank you.